This program contains graphic images and discussion of medical procedures. Viewer discretion is advised. morning. All right, so the first case I'm going to present um, is a case of the enlarging sac post-EVAR. Uh, so this is an 88-year-old male who had a history of an endovascular aortic repair with a Medtronic endurant for an asymptomatic 6.8 centimeter abdominal aortic aneurysm that was actually performed about nine months prior to us, to him presenting to us at an, um, from an, at an outside hospital. Uh, past medical history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia. Um, he had AFib and was on Coumadin um, for both the AFib and a mechanical valve. Um, never a smoker, no real strong family history of aneurysm. Um, he was thin, elderly male, um, ha and had a non-pulsatile palpable aneurysm on exam um, and had normal palpable pulses throughout. Uh, and this is a image of this. Let's see if this will play. So this was his CT scan when he pr first presented to us. <laughs> All right, um, and that measured about 11 centimeters. Um, so the real question was, does this patient have an endo leak? Um, obviously, his uh, aneurysm sac is enlarging. Um, where is it coming from? Um, potentially, there were some lumbars here, but we couldn't really tell. Was this maybe some contrast? Was there maybe a type 2 endo leak? Um, so we did an angiogram. Which really looked pretty good and didn't show much of anything. So I maybe want to open it up to the panel for discussion about kind of what to do next and where to go from here. So you just showed us the arterial phase on the CT. Did you have delayed imaging too? Um, we did. Um, these were some of the, these are still, our, I don't have any of the delayed images on here, but we did have some and there was really nothing that could demonstrate a um, convincing endo leak on the CT scan. So, you know, these are, these are challenging cases. Um, when I looked at that CT scan, it looked like the, the neck, the proximal neck length was uh, very short and it didn't look like the endograft was deployed all the way up to the lowest renal artery. It kind of went through there pretty quickly. It also looked like the left common iliac artery was very short as well. Um, you know, when I do an, what I call an endoleak hunt, I go in and I do magged up imaging, uh, several different oblique views, uh, looking for a type 1A. I'll then select the SMA, and I'll do a large volume prolonged injection, so a 4 for 16 injection uh, to try and see if I can uncover an IMA that's feeding it. And then I'll drop down, uh, inject my distal limbs, and then select the hypogastrics and do the same type thing to see if I can uncover a type 2. But uh, it's hard for me to tell where the source of the endoleak is with just a single uh, aortogram. You know, we have seen some, um, some type 3 endoleaks from uh, little, little holes in the grafts uh, on conversion. Uh, and it, it's been similar to this, where you don't see the endoleak, you don't see it on delayed views. So uh, one thing to consider here would be to reline the, the device. The problem that I have with these very large aneurysms where you don't know where the endoleak is coming from and then doing some kind of endovascular procedure is that the only follow-up you can get is whether the aneurysm keeps growing or not. And when it gets to be this size, I'm kind of worried about waiting for that to, to show. So this is the kind of patient that if, if it's a reasonable risk, we probably would, uh, would convert. You know, when you're treating these um, and you don't actually really know where the leakage is coming from, you don't have a specific target, you have to regard every intervention you do short of conversion as, a, as an experiment. 
And the bigger the aneurysm, the less likely you are to experiment, because the only way you're going to get any answer is by the behavior of the aneurysm, which may not be very friendly. And I have operated on several of these patients. They seem to find their way to my office. Um, and it's a, it's a mixed experience. Sometimes you will find uh, an accessory renal that is providing a type 2 endo leak. Sometimes you'll see a couple in the posterior wall. Sometimes you'll see you know, a little, little bit of sprinkling coming out through the stent graft. And sometimes you'll see absolutely nothing at all. You go in there, the aneurysm's 11 centimeters in diameter, you scoop out all the thrombus and there's nothing, there's nothing there. So what do you do then? Well, our approach has been to, to actually put an additional graft on the outside, not to take anything out, but just to add stuff and uh, create this sort of composite neck that consists of stent graft, uh, neck, and a, a third layer all sewn together in one proximal anastomotic ring. But, you know, you, you often just don't get an answer with these things. Those are great comments. Uh, what was the neck length before he had his original operation? We don't have that information. You don't have that information. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, no. And I'd agree with Tim. I, I think that if the patient came to you with a neck length of nine millimeters, what would you do? You'd offer the patient a fenestrated repair all the way up to the celiac. So doing the repair that should have been done in the first place after this endograft was put in is probably a, a good option, but you have to have that information going into it. But, but you know, the problem, that I, the problem that I have with that approach is that you're assuming that it is a type 1 endoleak. And like uh, uh, Tim said, the only follow-up you're going to have, because you don't see the endoleak, is whether or not the aneurysm keeps growing. If you, have, if you start out with a 10 or 11 centimeter aneurysm, I'm not willing to watch that aneurysm for another three to six months to see if it's growing, uh, doing an intervention that may or may not work. So that's why in these cases I, I, I tend to, uh, and you know what's, what's interesting is all of these patients are deemed high risk, uh, but then you convert them and they do fine. Uh, so, <laughs> well, you know. Can I just add one, one more thing? And <laughs> you, you, um, don't necessarily know the natural history of this disease. We have created a new disease here, and we don't know how it's going to behave. And I have had a patient come back to me who, you know, he, he'd had a lot of stuff done. So he was getting uh, surveillance imaging, and clearly on the imaging, he'd had a ruptured aneurysm. So I go back and ask him. He says, oh, yeah, you know, I had a little bit of pain a couple of months ago. No big deal. Um, his aneurysm had ruptured, and nothing had happened. There was no consequence because there was no endo leak. There was no place for the blood to come from. So we just don't know how these things behave. But I, I just want to uh, ask the panel, does the panel believe that a type 2 endo leak can lead to this? If that's the only problem. Great question because I have an anecdote to report to you. I did a four-vessel fenestrated repair on a lady with renal insufficiency, and she came back to me, and she had an expanded aneurysm. And I looked for an endoleak. I did what I just uh, described earlier. Went down and shot her hypogastric, and I could see only one little feeding vessel through a tiny little lumbar coming into the sac and feeding the endoleak. So I had her scheduled for a sac embolization that Friday. And that Monday night, she came in ruptured. And I took her to the operating room. I said, damn, I've made a mistake. I, I missed a type 1 or a type 3. So I started by going up and putting an aortic occlusion balloon in. Uh, well above the stent graft. I opened her abdomen, I opened the sac, scooped out all the clot, and I see this one little tiny back bleeder where that lumbar was. I oversewed that and I said, this has got to be a type 1. Let's let the balloon down. We let the balloon down, nothing. There was no type 1 endoleak. And I said, well, I can't leave the operating room without jacking her pressure up. So I had them artificially raise her blood pressure up to 200, 220 to make sure that I didn't have a type 1A endoleak, and there was none there. So I closed her sac, and that was it. It was a ruptured type 2 endoleak. I hadn't seen it before, but I think it's truly, it's not a pressure phenomenon. It's a biologic phenomenon in some of these patients, and what Tim said is true. We don't understand this disease. I, I, I can tell you that uh, we have several conversions where we've opened the aneurysm, uh, found a couple of back bleeders, Close them, close the aneurysm, patient's done fine. So it does, it does lead to aneurysm enlargement and rupture of the type 2 endoleaks. Yeah, I, I agree. I've seen rupture in type 2. It's rare. 
uh, but it, it, it is a potential cause in a patient. I mean, I'd say this, this patient has an endo leak or an infection, and it's probably not an infection. And I think that this is also probably a little bit more uh, um, uh, common of a problem. I think the Coumadin and the anticoagulation can play a role here. But I agree with Tim. I mean, I think that, the, that this disease, uh, if it's not a type 1, you know, type 1A or type 1B problem, uh, is different than just a large aneurysm. And, and although people will probably criticize me, there are a few patients in this situation where if you're concerned about something, we have put in endo anchors if there is still some neck just to make sure that everything is secure proximally, doesn't eliminate future options to build up proximally, uh, and then reline uh, if we think there could be uh, you know, a little fabric tear at a suture site or, or, or stent site or something like that if we can't find the type 2 leak, but we look pretty hard for the type 2 leak. So we looked pretty hard. Um, we did a tagged red blood cell scan um, after the negative angiogram, the CT scan that we couldn't find anything. This was actually negative. Um, it's hard to see in these images, but there was no evidence of um, active uh, lighting up within the aneurysm sac. Um, and so we had a long discussion with the family and the patient, and they really were not interested in any surgical options um, at that time. They wanted to wait. So um, we got a repeat CTA two months later, and as you can see, it, it's still growing. Um, it's now at about 13 centimeters. Um, and once again, we had another discussion with the family, and they are th mulling it over, um, and they're going to come back to us. But um, he's still alive and hasn't ruptured yet that we know of, um, but he's out there with a 13 centimeter. Let, let me give you one more aspect, because you know what? More anchors. I, I didn't yeah. know this patient was going to be presented, but I have a suspicion he might be one of mine. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I have to tell you, we had him set up for an open operation, a conversion, and he just didn't show up. So he's still out there. Um, if anybody <laughs> sees him. <laughs> but but I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what precipitated me towards conversion, to yeah. having said there is no indication for conversion <laughs> other than infection. This man can't eat now. It's pressing on his duodenum, and he's losing weight. You can see he's pretty thin. Well, he's going to get thinner. So finally, we have to do something to get rid of this lump. It's now become tumor surgery. I don't want to get too like, carried away here, but you know, Bobby, first of all, this, this is not statute of street and failure. So that's a joke, right? Aneurysms get bigger because there's just pressure. So eventually, they're going to rupture. We're just watching it. No, it's not the natural history of an aneurysm. It's, it's not. It's a it's different, different history. Okay, well, how many how many aneurysms have you seen enlarged to 13 centimeters? Yeah. So that means the treatment's not working. Oh, that's not necessarily true. The goal here is to prevent death. Death from bleeding out, and that may not happen. That's the only clean endpoint. That is that is true, but. Yeah, you have well, to recognize that everything we follow is it. if they die of something yeah, else. Yeah. That's not an aneurysm-related mortality. You know what? Everything that you're monitoring is a, is a, is a substitute. It's, it's um, a surrogate. And based on our understanding of the physiology. But frankly, I'll tell you, when we first started repairing aneurysms ever, we had no understanding of the physi physiology. We just put stent grafts in there, and lo and behold, it actually worked. It wasn't, it wasn't, it was You could have given him aspirin, and he'd probably be in the same situation, maybe smaller. It wasn't 6.8. It's, it's been a very long time. This, I'll tell you something else you have to consider, and I've thought this about this a, a lot. Patient. This is a different patient. This is a different patient. Holy, <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> this is a different You see, we do have the experience. <laughs> I'll tell you yeah. that one thing you do have to consider, though, just, just when you weigh up these factors, is that there's two forms of risk benefits analysis. One is the patient's risk and benefit, and the other is the physician's risk and benefit. And I've got to tell you that the physician's risk is much lower and benefit is much higher if you just intervene. So be aware that there is a subtle pressure on you to actually do something, which is why probably there are only two patients like this out there. There might be more. Um, Michael, you said that this was a pressure phenomenon, but I, my, my feelings on that have changed ever since I started doing transac embolization I go in, I put my catheter right into the endoleak using image guidance, and then I transduce a pressure. And sometimes I'll see 15 millimeters mercury, 20 millimeters mercury. It's never systemic. It's never 120, 140. And sometimes it's zero. 
So I think there is a component of a biologic phenomenon. There is continuing de degradation because of blood flow within the aneurysm sac. I don't know that it's a pressure phenomenon. You, you know what, one of, you out there might know Michael Lawrence Brown, do you know who that is? Well, he's yeah. a guy who, who um, was one of the pioneers in this field, and he actually has cultured a lot of very strange organisms from patients like this one. So we may actually be looking at some sort of uh, low-grade infection, because certainly the physiology is not, I mean, there's no endoleak there. Um, the aneurysm is continuing to grow. The physiology is not what we would normally suppose. <laughs> so on these, organisms, on these organisms that, that have been found, is there, are they sensitive to some kind of antibiotic? Because that would be the easiest thing to do here, you is know, to put I, antibiotics. I can't even remember the names of these organisms. They were that weird. I don't know. I mean, it'd be interesting because that would be a benign thing to do. If you're going to watch yeah, it, you might as well do something. 